Who here eats? Okay, we got, we got a few people. I think there might be, I'll ask one more time. Who, who here eats? Oh, there we go. Okay, good. Uh, otherwise, we have reason to be concerned. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit about the way I explore the future of food and technology, um, food experience, um, the ways we interact with food um, with my studio called Future Food Studio. If there's one thing I want everyone to remember after this talk, so if nothing else, it's that every mouth in this room today will transform the world tomorrow. And I think that's really important. Every mouth in this room today will transform the world tomorrow. When we eat, not only are we consuming things that give us energy and, and give us you know, beautiful skin and great hair, we're also having a huge impact on the world around us. So as was already introduced, I'm Dr. Erwin Adam, uh, founder and creative scientific director of Future Food Studio, where we think about all things food related and I have the privilege to lead a multidisciplinary team made up of engineers, chemists, computer programmers, designers, architects, who all come together to really consider every aspect of food. And so we work on things as small as things we actually eat, so actually making foods, to the tools that we use to interact with those foods, all the way up to larger scale projects um, and art installations that get us really immersed within the world of food. The one thing that underlies all the work that we do is the idea of creating food intent and food consciousness through delight. So we're really looking to create moments where people kind of take pause for a second and say to themselves, hey, like this is something I wasn't expecting, you know, and creating a little pause where they start to think about why it exists, why it's there. A lot of our work is a bit abstract and a bit conceptual, but then we like to create tangibles of it. So one of our early projects was the creation of edible clouds. We asked ourselves, what does it mean to take foods that we're so familiar with in terms of texture and flavor and color and the visual identities of what a food might be, but then deconstruct it into something far more ethereal, like a cloud. And so we found that we had a way to actually create these ethereal forms that are actual clouds that can be poured, they can be sipped, and they can allow us to experience foods that we're so familiar with in such a different way. Fundamental to that work, though, is actually the physiology of taste and flavor. So as much as it's this beautiful object that people gravitate towards and get excited about because they are unfamiliar with it, there's actually a reason why we've created it. And the idea behind this project was really taking the physiological process of taste and flavor, where we chew our food, generate tiny aerosols, which then go up through our retronasal passage, where we then collect all those little aerosols up in our olfactory neurons and start to understand the 10 to 20,000 different flavors that we can actually differentiate. So again, we have this beautiful object that actually leads into the physiology and biology of food. We have other projects that look at how we can use the sense of taste and the sense of smell to quantify the world around us. What does it mean to use taste to understand data or information? So another one of our early projects was really looking at taking large data sets and interpreting them as foods we might consume, like a beverage. So as an example, we would look at Twitter and we would say, hey, let's pull all the tweets from a city like Chicago and start identifying those tweets with sentiments. Are they happy? Are they sad? How do they feel? And then associate each of those sentiments or feelings with different flavors that then we could convert into a beverage. So then at any given point, someone could just tweet at our system and actually taste Chicago as it is in this moment. So we have a lot of these kind of conceptual things that we do, but again, they all come back to making us think bigger, make us think more about food, really start considering the impact of what it means to eat. 
when we think about the future of food, we really divide it into three different areas. The first is, what is food? The second is how we produce food or how we make food. And the third is really about how we experience food. Today we're going through a lot of rapid changes in the world of food that often seem like they're the far-reaching future, but are actually happening today. And many of those changes are motivated by changes that are happening in the world today. So when we look at the considerations of what is food, we start seeing a broad thematic around protein consumption. And really this question is revolving around what do we need to actually feed our, our, our societies and our, our populations? And what are the sources of proteins we can use to feed them? Because the ways that we have been feeding people to date are unsustainable. Um, we know that one kilogram of beef utilizes 15,000 liters of water. I don't know how to do that conversion. I'm Canadian, and I apologize. But we're also using one-third of all arable land on the earth in order to create feed for livestock. So there's a big movement that says, hey, let's diversify our protein portfolios or our protein consumption. Let's look at other sources for proteins, not to say let's eliminate everything as it is today, but let's take some of the pressure off of the system. And that's led to a huge boom in multiple different areas, one of particular interest being looking at crickets or insects as a new source of protein. Two billion people in the world today already consume insect proteins as one of their main sources of nutrition. And so over the last two years, we've seen probably over a hundred different companies in North America start creating new insect-based food products. And these get translated into everything from protein bars to uh, flowers, um, even into pasta sauce. And so this is really a, a huge pressure saying, hey, let's look at these more sustainable systems or you know, less energy intensive systems for feeding our people. Another direction that we've been looking is in the area of plant proteins. So we have this huge diversity of plants that exist in the world that we haven't really explored in understanding how they can feed us to their maximum extent, how we can use the properties of all these different plants to create the products that we consume today. We have companies that are putting out products that can mimic eggs using plant proteins, mimic mayonnaise using plant proteins. You know, what does it mean to start removing a lot of these animal intensive products and start looking towards plants? And something we forget is that today, 20% of the, the world's protein is already coming from grains, right? So though it's very popular to, to be afraid of, of grain and gluten, this is a product that actually is feeding so much of the world and providing so much of our protein already, and we've been using it for over 10,000 years. Another area where we consider um, the foods that we, we consume is in looking at packaging. And an emerging area of research has really, and product development, has really looked at saying, hey, we're packaging up foods and things that are actually completely disrupting the, 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 the world and our environment. Very, very, very you know, common problem is that of the plastic bottle. It takes about a third, so if you were to fill a, a plastic bottle a third of the way with petroleum or oil, that's how much it took to actually make that bottle. And we're using about 50 billion plastic bottles today in America. Where do they all go? They're not all being recycled. And so this is, again, one of those instigators who are saying, hey, how can we do better? And so there's companies that are looking at creating edible packaging. What does it mean if we could actually eat our coffee cup after we used it, or we could actually eat our bottle after we used it, and we're seeing that those derivatives are coming from plants, right? We're looking at using seaweed as a source for creating edible packaging, which suddenly becomes more regenerative and more sustainable in terms of its impact on the environment. The next area, broader area that we look at when we think about the future of food is really 
how we produce food. Something you may start seeing or may have started seeing already here is the, the advent of more urban agriculture, where people are saying, hey, like, how do we create these closed farm systems in cities to actually bring food closer to the people that we're feeding? And we're seeing these amazing projects, particularly in New York City, where these giant indoor farms are being built out. So a space that has maybe you know, 10 to 40,000 square feet in it is providing the amount of food that maybe 200 acres of land can produce naturally. And we're looking at all kinds of different technologies, whether aeroponics, so that's growing food in air um, with light mists, or aquaponics, um, where we're actually using fish to provide the nutrients for growing food in water. So there's all these different technologies that are pushing, saying, hey, let's grow food a little bit differently. One of the most incredible tools, though, that we can offer up today are the use of drones and robots in farmers' fields. So as much as those closed-loop sy closed systems are great, nothing really beats the sun and the rain. But something we do find is that farmers, particularly smaller farmers, need the technologies that make it possible to compete with larger farms. And so very rapidly, we're starting to see the use of robots and drones you know, starting to monitor the fields, check the quality and the health of the plants, deliver nutrients, deliver um, pesticides, very particularly exactly where they're needed as opposed to, to broadly distributing them across the field. We're using drones in order to actually monitor entire fields that are using very complex technologies that are coming from NASA to actually plot out exactly what's going on with every single plant so then other drones and robots can come in and take care of them. And so this is something that we don't really think too much about when we live in a city, but these are very real technologies that are starting to be brought to farmers' fields. The last area that we focus on in our studio is really the ways that we experience food. And for us, Food experience is really about the way all of our senses come together in order to create a unified food experience. So what does it mean when we bring all of our senses together? You know, we're talking about sight, sound, taste, touch. All those inputs come into our brain and are collected, brought together, and then they create that single moment of whatever it is that we're consuming or eating. And so over the last decade, we've seen a lot of research show us quite with strong evidence that this is very real. So one of the more important ingredients to our food beyond just what's actually in it is actually the environment around it and the way that we interact with that environment. So we know taste is obvious. We all know that food has a taste. Smell contributes to flavor. Taste and smell come together to really create those 10 to 20,000 different flavors that we can differentiate. But then when we start looking at sound, research has shown that higher pitches of sound and higher frequencies of sound can actually make food taste sweeter. What does it mean when we start using sound as an ingredient in a food experience? When we look at touch, similarly, what does it mean to touch something soft versus touch something rough when we're eating some, a food product. And what we found is rougher surfaces tend to give more crisp notes to food. So we're starting to actually integrate all these other senses in creating a single unified food experience. And that's now translating slowly into the technology sector and saying, hey, what are those technologies that then can contribute to those food experiences, right? What does it mean to put somebody into a virtual environment when they're eating food and actually use that as part of what they're doing, uh, what they're experiencing in terms of the food that they're consuming? So the way we utilize all this information in the studio is by designing out across each of the senses. And so a big area for us is really this notion of immersive dining experiences, where we bring people into our spaces and we control the entire 360 environment in every aspect of every sense. 
And what we find is you can suddenly bring a broader spectrum of food experience to your guests. And suddenly you're able to experiment more because you realize that the meal isn't only what's on the dish, but it's also what's outside of it. Coming back to where we started is really, again, this notion of every mouth in this room transforming the world around them. Everything that you consume has a huge impact on the environment. Everything you consume has a huge impact on technology and the way it develops. Everything you consume has an impact on the person sitting next to you. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and really imbue. Think about what you eat. Cheers. <laughs>